for climate change, which policies work, which don't? Hmm. Which are, when we look at this formula of $1 in, $45 out, for climate change, what dollar in, what policies for dollar in and, and dollar out are good and which are not? So, uh, so we actually did a, a a whole project back in 2009 when, when the the whole world circus was coming to Copenhagen, oh, and yes. we were going to save the world there. Uh, we brought together uh, about 50 climate economists and three Nobel laureates to look at where can you spend a dollar and do the most good for climate. And what they found was a lot of these things, as we've been talking about before, that that basically investing in in the current sort of technology that we're trying very hard is at best a pretty dicey outcome. Uh, much of it is probably less than a dollar back in the dollar. Uh, there's some uh, investments in, on uh, adaptation, for instance, that's pretty good, but it's you know, sort of two, three dollars back in the dollar. Oh, what uh, is adaptation? The obvious thing is that you build a dike for a sea level rise, uh, or that you make people, uh, you get some apps that people know that there's a hurricane coming or that, you know, so you can adapt to infrastructure, right? Yes. The, 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 the physical the, and the digital infrastructure. Yes. The, the point is that people are really good at doing this already, uh, because they have a strong incentive to do it. So the extra thing that governments can do outside is somewhat good, but it's not amazing or anything. What we found by far the best, uh, investment in the long run was on investment in energy innovation. So, uh, and and I think this also sort of corresponds with what we would think in general. Uh, if we could innovate, so, you know, for instance, Bill Gates is arguing we should have fourth generation nuclear. So the next, uh, the more advanced than what we currently have in third generation nuclear, which would be uh, uh, industrial scale process. You'd just be building these, you know, uh, uh, modular nuclear power plants. They would be, instead of being this artwork that we design once for every d different plant, which is one of the reasons why they're so expensive, they would just be mass produced and you'd have one, you know, uh, 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 they would all be recognized in one go, so it'd be much cheaper. They would also be passively safe, so uh, if if all the power goes, they'll shut down rather than go boom. Uh, so that's, that's another very good yeah. thing. And then they'll also uh, be very hard to transform into nuclear uh, weapons. Uh, so you can actually imagine them being out in a lot of different places where we'd perhaps be a little worried about having you know plutonium lying around. Now, this is all still being worked out. But imagine if that actually comes out. And, and again, remember, the other three generations, they were we were also told that it'll be incredibly safe and it'll be incredibly cheap. And it didn't turn out that way. So let's, let's wait. But it could be. And so the argument is invest in these ideas, for instance, fourth generation nuclear. And if fourth generation nuclear becomes cheaper than fossil fuels, we're done. Everyone will just switch, not just rich, well-meaning Americans or Europeans, but also the Chinese, the Indians, everybody in Africa, the rest of the uh, uh, Indian subcontinent. That's how you fix these issues, right? So the idea here is to say, instead of thinking that we can sort of push people to do stuff they really don't want to do, which is basically saying let's let's use more of the uh, you know the solar and wind that you would otherwise have invested in, force people to buy an electric car by giving huge subsidies because otherwise they're clearly not all that interest in buying it and so on, then get the innovation such that they become cheaper than fossil fuels and everyone will switch. Uh, this is how we've solved problems in the past, if you yeah. think. And in Los Angeles in the 1950s was a hugely polluted place, mostly because of cars. The sort of standard climate approach today would be to tell everyone in Los Angeles, I'm sorry, could you just walk instead? Yeah. <laughs> and of course, that just doesn't work. That doesn't pay off. You never get, you know, politicians voted in office or at least staying in office if you make that kind of policy. What did solve the problem was the innovation of the catalytic converter. You basically get this little gizmo and it costs a couple hundred dollars and you put it on your tailpipe and then you can drive around and basically almost not pollute. Mm -hmm. And that's how you fix the air pollution in Los Angeles. Basically, we've solved all problems in humanity, all big, difficult problems with innovation. We haven't solved it by telling everyone, I'm sorry, could you be a little less comfortable yeah. and a little more cold and a little poorer uh, and believing that that can go on for you know decades, and and while it 
possibly works in some pockets of the US. And I, I think actually in, in large parts of Europe, at least, it used to, uh, the, this, uh, the, the war in Ukraine is definitely sort of changing that whole perspective. But you know, there's a willingness to say, we're going to you know, suffer a little, but then we'll fix this problem. But the point is, we're going to be willing to suffer a little and so fix a tiny bit of mm. the climate problem instead of actually focusing on innovation. So what we found was, if you spend a dollar on innovation, you will probably avoid about $11 of climate damage in the long run, which is a great investment. And the terrible thing is, we have not been doing this. So because everybody is focused on saying, we need this solution within the next 12 years, it means you're not thinking about the innovation. We're actually spending less money, not more money, on uh, on innovation globally. So everyone is focusing on a reducing carbon emission versus innovating on yeah. alternate energy. You're basically well, focusing on putting the existing solar panels or wind turbines, which are either you know, just about inefficient or inefficient, instead of making the next generation, or it's more likely the 10th the generation after that, that comes with lots of you know, uh, battery backup power, or you know, uh, uh, fourth generation nuclear, or you know, Craig Venter has this great idea. Craig Venter, the guy who cracked the human genome back in two thousand, he has this idea of growing algae out on the ocean surface. These algae, they'd be genetically modified, and they would basically soak up sunlight and CO two, and produce oil. Then we could basically just grow our own Saudi Arabia out on the ocean surface, and we'd harvest it. We'd keep our entire fossil fuel economy, but it'd now be net zero because. We just soaked right. up the CO2 out there. In the One dollar invested in the portfolio of different ideas. Yes. Gives and, $11 yeah. back. I, I first wrote about that in the New York Times. It was one of my actual page one stories. Um, in 2006, it was declining R&D in energy at a time of global warming. And it, it, the baseline is so low for this that it's a, it's a super bargain. We were... In, during the there was a, during the energy crisis the seventy the first energy crisis in the seventies before the current one um, our annual spending in the United States and constant dollars on R and D research and development for energy was about five billion dollars and then it, it's just dribbled away since then and recently now there's a big burst of new money coming through these new bills that got passed uh, but what I was told over and over again by people in that arena is you can't just have these little bubbles of investment. It ha you don't get young people away from thinking about Wall Street for jobs towards thinking about energy innovation if there isn't like a future there. And a lot of the, in the United States and Europe, the presumption was the way to that future was taxing carbon. Mm -hmm. You make that so punitive that the you're basically level eviling, evening the landscape for cleaner stuff that's more expensive. That's a, uh, that has failed completely. There are little examples in Europe where it's working. And what's happened now is, well, in the United States, this big chunk of money is designed to take us over a finish line that was started with not just innovation, but with the production efficiency too. This is one thing I got wrong, I think, a little bit in my reporting. I was so fixated on the innovation part, just because I love science too. I saw this untapped possibility that others were saying, no, no, production efficiency, the more people are producing batteries, the cheaper they'll get. This is Elon Musk's uh, you know, path and many others. And it really is both. So when you were talking about purchasing power for governments, for example, that can stimulate production capacity for batteries or whatever the good thing is and take you down faster. And it's all about getting that margin of the new thing out competing the old. And it's not just innovation. It has so many parts of the pipeline that need to be nurtured. So, so, and and the other thing is relative cost. The United States, when I was writing about this in 2006, uh, our budget for DARPA, the Advanced Research Project Agency for for the Defense Department, for just for science, for was 80 billion a year. For health, for, for medical frontier research on cancer and stuff, 40 billion. Energy was two or three. So we weren't taking this remotely seriously. So now that if we get that up, to me, to me, there's like this level, you know, we're taking something seriously when it's like in the tens of billions for R&D. It's not that R&D will solve the problem, but, our, but it's a proxy for what we really care about. We care a shitload about defense, 
What's the defense budget in the United States now? Like 800 billion? It's some insane number. Who's counting when you're having fun? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so um, innovation is not just like for the better, you know, camera, the better solar panel, the better battery. Social innovation actually matters hugely. Like the guy in Nairobi I mentioned with a company doing micropayment gas to get people off charcoal. We need that as much as this. And I actually, I interviewed Bill, uh, Bill Gates. Uh, we had spent an hour with him in Seattle in 2016 um, it was when he was rolling out his breakthrough energy thing. I got to spend, it was 45 minutes, me and Bill Gates, which was pretty fun. But I, I brought this up. I said, you know, because he's all about the new nuclear thing that will solve the world's problems. And I, yes, yes, yes. But oh, we he also- he brought up nuclear? Sorry to interrupt. Oh, he did. Oh, sure. Oh, yeah. interesting. So he's interested in, the, in one of the- Oh, he's investing heavily in, in nuclear, but he invests in everything. You know, he's got a big portfolio. Um, but I brought up a guy I met in India um, who runs a little outfit called Selco that they do really interesting, cool village to village. They're like a, an energy analyst will come to your house here in the States and- tell you how to weatherize your house, but they do it at the village scale. And in a village that has, um, where they're milling wheat, he'll put in a solar powered wheat wheat mill. And you know that's not gonna solve the world's problems, but it gives them a way to control their energy. They don't have to buy something to grind their wheat. And, and that needs just as much attention as the the things I really like too, the, the cool technologies. And and, and I, I thought I cornered Bill Gates, I was like, because he really does focus on these big wins, the big, you know, like nuclear, that will make net zero completely doable. And I said, well, you know, what about nuclear, like New York City, where I was still living at the time, or near, and I said, it's got a million buildings. New York City has 1 million buildings. And in 2013, the Bloomberg government analyzed, they said, looking ahead to 2050, 75% of the buildings in New York City that will exist in 2050 already exist. We think about these brave new futures, right? Like we're just gonna like come in, and have these shiny, cool, passive house cities. And I, I, so I put this to Bill and I said, so what's the, how do you do that? How do you, how do you retrofit all those boilers, many of which were coal fired like 20 years ago to get a zero energy New York City? And he, I, thought, I, I kind of thought I had him. <laughs> and then he, he immediately, he kind of sat back and went, well, but if you have unlimited clean power coming into that city, it doesn't really matter. It's a pretty good Bill Gates impression. It was a good, it, yeah. it was a good answer. I mean, it was a good answer. Yeah. He said, oh yeah, it's a leaky bucket, but you know, yeah. if you pour in zero carbon energy, then it doesn't matter. But I still think we have to figure out the other part too. The that end, how do you how do you innovate at the household level, at the village level? It's much more of a distributed problem. We used to think the one the one big change I've had in my own thinking too is is from top down to distributed. Everything about the climate problem through the first three decades of my reporting was that the, the IPCC will come out a new report, the, the framework convention, the treaty will get us on board, we'll all behave better. This, it has this like top down, you know, parent to child architecture. And everything I've, I've learned has gone the other way. It's distributed capacity for improved lives, you know, kids getting through school, women not having to spend three hours collecting firewood. And if it means propane for that household in that context, that's a good thing. So stop with all your yammering about ending all fossil fuel subsidies. And, you know, what's an America look like that has some climate, climate safe energy future? Find your part in that don't get disempowered by the, the scale of it. There's there's like a thousand things to do when you start to cut it into pieces. So so it's a very different. It's not a top down thing. You know, no one's going to magically come in and, and 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 that's that's where I think. So I I agree that everyone should try to play their their part and 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 do you know whatever they can. Uh, but I also think you know just the the sheer incentives. You know what we saw happening with uh, you know with uh, shale gas is a great example. Yeah. <clears throat> when shale gas becomes so cheap that you just stop using coal, that then you don't really have oh, to totally. convince you know lots and lots of people. You know, it just coal happened. is really and bad. It wasn't labeled a climate. No, no it, it wasn't, wasn't a climate thing. It no, was no, an energy it, thing. It was totally uh, and 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 the, and the point is just you know the power of an innovation is that you you almost don't see it anymore. It just happens, uh, and and I think that's really the only way we're going to fix 
you know, these big problems. If you think about, you know, uh, the uh, nutrition problem back in the 60s, 70s, uh, you know, we worried a lot about India and other places. Uh, a solution is not worrying or the solution was not, you know, us eating a little bit less and sending it down to India or wherever. The solution was the green revolution, right? It was the fact that some scientists made ways to make every seed produce three times as much. So you could grow three times as much food on an acre. And you know, that's what basically made it possible for India to go from a basket case to uh, the world's leading uh, rice exporter. Uh, and, and, and that's how you do these things. You, you solve these big problems through innovation. And, and again, I'm not saying that, you know, we're actually arguing a carbon tax is a smart thing to do. You know, that's what any economist would tell you to do. Right. But it also turns out that it's partly, it's not going to solve most of the problem and it's incredibly politically hard to do. So it may also just be the wrong sort of tree to bark up uh, against. You know, if you can do it, please do. Uh, but this is not the main thing that's going to solve climate. The the main thing is that we get these innovations that basically make green energy so cheap everyone will just want it.